Hi everyone, welcome to St John's Online. Today we're going to be finishing the final talk in our series on asking the big questions. And Chris Boyce is going to be answering the question, why pray? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You may have noticed that each week as we gather together as the church family of St. John's, we do a lot of praying. We say prayers together, such as the general thanksgiving that we're going to pray in a moment, and the Lord's Prayer. And then people also pray with us and for us, such as Chris Keith will do later after the sermon. And perhaps you've wondered why we do that. Why do we pray? Well, Chris will answer that for us in a little while. But for now, let's say one of those corporate prayers together as we talk to God and we give him thanks. So will you say with me? Gracious God, we humbly thank you for life and health and safety, for freedom to work, leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and human life. But above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your spirit and the hope of sharing in your glory. 
Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, I'm going to hand over to the musicians now who are going to lead us in a time of praise.
Okay, well, we're going to come to a time of community notices. So I'm the community chaplain here at St John's Wishart, and I, one of my great privileges is to bring the community notices. And this week, our notices are all in the form of birthdays. We have four birthdays that we're celebrating within our church family. So Judy, who is Cheryl's mum, who's been tuning in with us. Hi, Judy. Um, happy birthday for Tuesday. We have Owen, who has his birthday uh, later this week, along with David Rogers Smith and Oliver. So we hope that all four of you have a wonderful time celebrating your birthdays this week. Will you let me pray for these people? Lord God, we thank you so much for Judy, for Owen, for David and Oliver. We thank you for the way that you are at work in and through each one of them. We thank you for their fellowship with us here at St. John's. And we pray for them this week that they will have a wonderful time celebrating the years that you have given them and looking forward to the years ahead. Uh, years of knowing you and loving you and serving you. And we pray that for your name and your glory in Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, we're going to continue in praying now as we pray in the lead up to hearing the scriptures. So one of the ways that we pray is asking God to help us understand the scriptures as they are read for us. So will you pray with me? Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing us the way of salvation through faith in your Son. We ask you now to teach and encourage us through your word so that we may be ready to serve you for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll just prepare you to, this is quite a long reading that's coming up. We have all of Isaiah 36 and 37. So settle in, it's a very interesting read as we hear about Hezekiah and his prayers to our great God. Thanks, Sue. The reading today comes from Isaiah chapter 36 and chapter 37. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. Then the king of Assyria sent his field commander with a large army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. When the commander stopped at the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the waterman's field, Elakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder, went out to him. The field commander said to them, Tell Hezekiah, This is what the great king, the king of Syria, says. On what are you basing this confidence of yours? You say you have strategy and military strength, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Look now, you are depending on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff which pierces a man's hand and wounds him if he leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. And if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar? Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. How then can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you are depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this land without the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. Then Elakim, Shebna and Joah said to the field commander, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, since we understand it. Don't speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people on the wall. But the commander replied, Was it only to your master and you that my master sent me to say these things and not to the men sitting on the wall, who, like you, will have to eat their own filth and drink their own urine? Then the commander stood and called out, to, called out in Hebrew, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, The Lord will surely deliver us. 
This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of, As of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then every one of you will eat from his own vine and fig tree and drink water from his own cistern until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Do not let Hezekiah mislead you when he says, The Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sedfarvaim? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? But the people remained silent and said nothing in reply, because the king had commanded, Do not answer him. Then Eliakim, Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder, went to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him what the field commander had said. Chapter 37. When the king Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and went into the temple of the Lord. He sent Eli Eliakim, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and the leading priests, all wearing sackcloth, to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They told him, this is what Hezekiah says. This day is a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace, as when children come to the point of birth and there is no strength to deliver them. It may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of the field commander, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God, and that he will rebuke him for the words the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, pray for, pray for the remnant that still survives. When King Hezekiah's officials came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Tell your master, this is what the Lord says, Do not be afraid of what you have heard, those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, I am going to put a spirit in him so that when he hears a certain report, he will return to his own country. And there I will have him cut down with the sword. When the field commander heard the king of Assyria had left Lachish, he withdrew and found the king fighting against Libna. Now Sennacherib received a report that Terhaka, Ter the Cushite, king of Egypt, was marching out of light fight against him. When he heard it, he sent messages to Hezekiah with this word, Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, Do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says, Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. Surely you have heard what the king, kings of Assyria have done to all countries, destroying them completely. And will you be delivered? Did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my forefathers deliver them, the gods of Gozan, Haran, Rezef, and the people of Eden who were in Tel Asar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sirhavaim, Sir or of Hena, or Eva? Hezekiah received the letter from the messages and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord Almighty, God of Israel, and throne between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to all the words Sennacherib has sent to insult the living God. It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste all these peoples and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. 
Now, O Lord our God, deliver us from his hand so that all kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. Then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent a messenger to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Because you have prayed to me concerning Sarasherim, king of Assyria, this is the word of the Lord. This is the word the Lord has spoken against him. The virgin daughter of Zion despises and mocks you. The daughter of Jerusalem tosses her head as you flee. Who is it you have insulted and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes in pride? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your messages you have heaped insults on the Lord, and you have said, With my many chariots I have ascended the heights of the mountains, the utmost heights of Lebanon. I have cut down its tallest cedars, the choicest of its pines. I have reached its remotest heights, the finest of its forests. I have dug wells in foreign lands and drunk the water there. With the soles of my feet I have dried up all the streams of Egypt. Have you not heard? Long ago I ordained it. In days of old I planned it. Now I have brought it to pass. That you have turned fortified cities into piles of stone. Their people, drained of power, are dismayed and put to shame. They are like plants in the field, like tender green shoots, like grass sprouting on the roof, scorched before it grows up. But I know where you stay and when you come and go, and how you rage against me. Because you rage against me and because your insolence has reached my ears, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth, and I will make you return by the way you came. This will be the sign for you, O Hezekiah. This year you will eat what grows by itself, and the second year what springs from that. But in the third year, sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Once more, a remnant of the house of Judah will take root below and bear fruit above. For out of Jerusalem will come a remnant, and out of Mount Zion a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day, while he was worshipping worshipping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons, Adramalek and Shazareza, cut him down with the sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat. And Esau Haddon, his son, succeeded him as king. Hello, everybody. Here we come to the third of our um, big questions, asking the big questions. And today we're going to look at what on earth is the point of praying? Why pray? So... Let's, um, even if you're not sure about this, I'm going to start by praying. Heavenly Father, I pray that you uh, make it clear to us why we should pray and the benefits of praying and um, deliver any of us of, who find this a great irksome duty. Uh, help it to be our delight. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, um, what inspired me to give this talk was uh, an article by David Inst Instant Brewer, and the material uh, borrows a lot from an article I read of his. I start, though, with an apocryphal story. Well, I think it's apocryphal. It's about a cat belonging to a vicar, belonging to a, a rector, 
stuck up a tree. And so the re rector decided he would mount a rescue mission and he climbed a ladder, tied one end of the rope to the tree and the other end of the rope to his tow bar um, of his car. And he gently drove forward, hoping that he could bend the tree enough to be able to rescue the cat. However, the inevitable happened. The rope snapped, catapulting, sorry about that, the cat into the sky. No more was heard of the cat until a few weeks later, the, the rector went to visit a member of his church. And a young mum and her little boy, Johnny, were there in the front room and lying on the rug was the, the, the vicar, the rector's cat. How did you find such a lovely cat? The vicar asked with thinly disguised innocence. You will never believe it, replied the mother. My little Johnny had been asking for a cat for months. In the end, I got so tired, I told him, come out in the garden where I was hanging out the washing and I told him the only thing to do was to pray. So we put our hands together and looked to the heavens and dear Jesus, we prayed, Please send us a pussycat. And you'll never guess what happened next, vicar. Now, amusing and probably apocryphal as that story is, we're looking at what really is the point of praying. Does it really make any difference if we pray? Surely, if God wants something to happen, then it'll happen whether we pray or not. That being the case, why are we encouraged to pray at all? Well, sometimes the Bible gives us a glimpse behind the scenes of what does happen when we pray. And the counter to that is what might have happened if we hadn't prayed. I guess the bottom line is we need to pray because Jesus, the Son of God, the upholder of the universe, would pray, often all night. And he taught us how to pray. He gave us a, a model prayer or framework for our prayers. So what I want to go to is a classic Old Testament story of, uh, for, it was for desperate prayer. I love this account in Isaiah. Um, the thrilling real life story is told three times in the Bible. And it's a terrible time for the nation of Judah as the superpower of Syria and their king, King Sennacherib, invaded them. The most powerful army in the world, having conquered and devastated several other countries, arrives outside the walls of Jerusalem with a massive army, at least 185,000 crack troops. And they have the equivalent of the, of the latest tanks and field guns and bombs and in the shape of cavalry, chariots, archers, siege weapons. And the Assyrian commander shouted taunts to those inside the city walls, taunts in their own language about the inadequacy of any gods that had so far stopped them. The inadequacy of the Judean army, even if they were loaned 2,000 horses. And King Hezekiah had deceived them in trusting Yahweh, the living God of heaven's army. Now for Hezekiah, trusting God didn't mean sitting back and waiting. He put on the sackcloth, the, the, the clothing of a penitent, and went to the temple where he believed God's residence was, if you like, and he went there to pray. Normally when we pray, we have no idea what goes on in heaven. But because the prophet Isaiah was in the city, we're given an incredible insight into what happened next. In response to the prayer, God decided to act, and he told Isaiah his plan. And Isaiah is to say this to Hezekiah. Do not be afraid because of the words you've heard with which the young men of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Behold, I'll put a spirit in him so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I'll make him fall by the sword in his own land. Well, the next few verses are a surprise. Sennacherib did indeed receive a report that the king of Cush was marching north from Egypt, but he did not run away like God said he would. Instead, he sent this message to Hezekiah. 
Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you. Have the gods of the nations delivered them, the nations that my fathers destroyed? Perhaps at this point, we would have faltered in our faith. God had said he would help, and he'd even revealed the plan, specifically through the prophet Isaiah, and the plan and the outcome did not seem to match what was happening. Does that mean God got it wrong? Well, of course not. He was testing Hezekiah's faith. Would God do such a thing by lying? No, in this story, the test is about arrogant Sennacherib who thought he could rebel against God's plan and despise his protection over his people. So therefore, the best way for Hezekiah to react to this is to fight this kind of evil, and the way to do that was through more prayer. Hezekiah didn't think for a moment that God's will had been frustrated because he wasn't powerful enough. His faith is clear and certain. Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Now, such a powerful faith does not deny the reality. He acknowledges in his prayer that this evil king had indeed flattened all in his path. It is true that the, the, the kings of Assyria have destroyed all these nations and they have thrown the gods of these nations into the fire and burned them. But of course the Assyrians could destroy them. They were no gods at all. The idols of wood and stone shaped by human hands. So here is the crux of his trust in the true God of heaven. How could man-made idols of wood and stone actually be effective at all? And it is from this point that he now lays down his request, his intercession, his plea for rescue. So now, our Lord God, save us from the hand of all the kingdoms of the earth, that all the kings of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. God replied to Hezekiah again via Isaiah to say what would happen. What would happen next? Now here's, here's the dynamite in this story. This, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning of him. Because you have prayed to me. The Hebrew clearly says, according to the scholars I've read, because is a word asher. And it's the same sense of the word used in an earlier story in Genesis. Um, and that's a story of terrible revenge executed by Jacob's sons in Genesis 34. Because, as a consequence of, the reason such and such happens. And God is acting in response to Hezekiah's second prayer. And when Sennacherib didn't leave Jerusalem as God said he would, God told Hezekiah he would now make him leave. And he would do this because Hezekiah had prayed to him. This time God uses overwhelming force to make Sennacherib leave. 185,000 of his army died at the hand of an angel of the Lord. We have no idea what means the angel used. The Bible's not interested in our morbid curiosity. But this death toll forced Sennacherib to act, and he fled back to Nineveh. And there, just as God said in his first message, he was killed by his own sons. How tragic! And such huge numbers of deaths could have been avoided if Sennacherib hadn't been so rebellious, hadn't been so arrogant. He would have simply withdrawn when news came of the army from the south, as he was told to do. No one would have died. He had clearly known this was God's way to make him leave because he wrote to Hezekiah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you. Consider also that a different disaster would have happened if Hezekiah had not continued to pray. So Naturib's army would have invaded 
and ravaged Jerusalem. We might tell ourselves that surely God would have stepped in, but the clear and astonishing message of God's action is because Hezekiah prayed. So, persistent prayer. We're urged to persist in our prayer. Jesus, uh, in a delightful way, tells us to persist when we pray. He told at least two parables illustrating this. One is a, a story, a, a parable of someone rudely awoken by a friend battering on his door at midnight because the friend has just had another friend returning from his travels and he needs three loaves of bread urgently. He's embarrassed because his pantry is empty. Now, that's hard for us to understand the urgency of this living as we do outside Middle Eastern obligation to invite such unexpected visitors to come in and, uh, and eat and stay the night. And we might, might imagine that the one indoors might have just got the baby off to sleep and he hisses through the door, you know, go away, we've locked up for the night and all the little ones are here in bed and they just settled them in bed. Plainly the knocking persists, which is the point of the parable. He gets up and opens the door uh, for two reasons. Because he's his friend and because of his boldness uh, in the New International vi um, Version, or his impudence in the English Standard Version, or his shameless audacity in the New Living Translation. He gets up and he gives him as much as he needs. The other parable Jesus tells us expressly to persist in, persist in prayer is in Luke 18. And this is, uh, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show that they should always pray and not give up. He said in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared for what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, and I believe it could be the sense of box your box my ears, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. That's the boxing ears bit. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? I finish with a story from uh, Robert Dunn's book. The book is entitled, Don't Just Stand There, Pray Something. Ronald Dunn tells of, uh, in his church, they came under great conviction that they should set up a, a, a chain of intercession 24-7. Uh, and he tells of a prayer chapel that he set up in his church and had people rostered to pray uh, and the, the, the folk in, in his um, parish or in his, his pastorate were, uh, would phone in for prayer requests. So he writes, it had been set up after being convic convinced that this was the way forward for their church. They had appealed, built a special place, got phone lines put in and signed up 200 excited intercessors ready and eager to go. The phone rang as soon as it was up and running. Their first request, they were in business. There was a young mother in the congregation. She was terrified. She was calling from hospital where they'd just brought their two-year-old son. Somehow this little chap had managed to get hold of a can of car engine cleaning fluid and drank some of this highly toxic, toxic stuff. He was screaming. He was convulsed, and the doctor offered no help. He had ingested enough poison to finish off an adult, let alone a toddler. Further, if by some chance he did live, he would be blind. John Dunn writes, so began our ministry of intercessory prayer. He also admits that his heart sank. He just knew Satan had bowled them out for a duck. And all these new enthusiastic intercessors who had just taken into their belief 14 weeks of preaching on intercessory prayer, they'd be so discouraged. Why couldn't the Lord have sent them something a little easier? And they could graduate to the hard stuff later. 
The doctors knew what they were talking about and it would all end with less faith than they started with. The intercessors were given the request. They came, they prayed, they rostered a 24-hour roster and that little man was prayed for earnestly all day and all night. 24 hours after the first phone call, it rang again. It was the mother calling from the hospital. She was crying. She was laughing. She was praising God. The doctor didn't understand it, but her baby was going to recover. And there was no damage to any of his vital organs or his eyes. Wasn't it wonderful? It had to be a miracle. He concludes, and so it was. I had thought it best to launch our intercessory ministry with the possible and work up to the impossible. But God started with the impossible and demonstrated from the beginning the awesome power of prayer. Prayer is the secret of Jesus. He's passed it on to us. But not all Christians receive it. So this is our challenge. Can you join me uh, with me as we pray? Lord Jesus, we confess we find prayer such hard work. We also confess, Lord, that often our faith is pathetic. Heavenly Father, help us to obey the Lord Jesus who modeled prayer, taught us to pray and said, when you pray, not if you pray. Thank you for the exciting story of Hezekiah and his rock-solid faith, his trust in you, and the remarkable fact that it was because he prayed that you came to the rescue. In all our prayers, Lord, may we seek your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
come to a different time of prayer now, and that is as we bring our prayers to God in confession. Uh, Hebrews says to us, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So let's confess our sins to our almighty God. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, let me read to you these words of assurance of the forgiveness of those sins that we have just confessed. In Romans 6, Christ died for sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves to dead, dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And in Hebrews, Jesus is able for all time to save those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Chris Keith is going to continue our time of prayer now. Thanks, Chris. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, how blessed we are to be able to call you Father. How blessed we are to be your children adopted into your forever family. You are the God who created the universe and who rules over all kingdoms. Yet because of Jesus, we can come freely into your presence. We can speak to you because you first spoke to us and brought us into a secure relationship with yourself. Thank you that as a loving Father, you show your care for us in so many ways. Thank you that in these troubled times, your word tells us not to be anxious about anything but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, we are to present our requests to you. So, Father, we come to you now praying for our world, knowing that you are the one who is sovereign over all. Father, we ask that you would stop the spread of the coronavirus. We pray for those in Victoria and New South Wales where the disease is still spreading. We pray for those in countries where COVID is rampant. We pray, Father, that you would cause this virus to recede and diminish. We bring before you those who are sick, that they will have access to the care and treatment they need. We uphold before you health workers and carers and pray for their protection. We pray for those struggling with isolation and quarantine. We pray for families that are concerned about vulnerable loved ones. We pray too for those who are suffering loss of income and who are wondering how they will manage to keep going. Father, be their strength and their provision and help us to support them in practical ways wherever we can. We pray for wisdom for our federal and state leaders as they seek to balance public safety and economic concerns. But above all, we pray, Lord, that this continuing situation will cause people to think in the light of eternity and turn to you in repentance and faith. We pray for our church. Father, we pray especially for Peter and Michelle as they seek ways to keep serving the body of Christ at St John's during these difficult times. Strengthen and uphold them, we pray, and protect them as they continue to seek appropriate ways to minister among us. Thank you for the various gifts you have given to our people that have enabled us to continue worshipping you together, even though we are physically apart. Thank you, Father, for reminding us today of the importance of coming to you in prayer. Thank you that at St John's we can now meet and pray together daily on Zoom. And I pray that at this time of physical separation, that prayer and care for one another will be an ever-increasing part of our lives. I pray that we will learn to depend more and more on you. 
please give us trust in you and perseverance and hope as we grapple to live godly lives in our ever-changing world. Father, we also pray for those we know who are serving you overseas. Lord, you know the sacrifices they have made to leave family and friends in the comforts of home, and you know what they need to continue serving you in the countries where you have placed them. Thank you, Father, that you are Jehovah Jireh, the God who provided for Abraham and the God who still provides for us today. Watch over and protect our friends, we pray, and supply what they need as they continue to live in trust and obedience to you. Father, there are many people in our church family and community. We want to commend to your fatherly care. We pray for all those known to us who are in sorrow, sickness, fear, discouragement, or any other trouble. Give them patience, Father, and help them to keep trusting in your infinite goodness. Lord, you are the one who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to your power that is at work within us. To you be all the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's conclude our time of prayer together. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, feeding us, us with your word and encouraging us in our meeting together. Take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your spirit and in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm going to hand over to the musos again as we sing our final song together.
brings our formal service to an end. Please stay around and join us for morning tea on Zoom. So the link for that will either come up below you here or come up on the screen as we finish up. Next week, we're going to be starting a new series in the book of Jonah. Now, our plan is that we'll actually be doing that live stream from here in the church building at 9.30 a.m. next Sunday. But as we've all learned in 2020, our plans and God's plans don't always match up. So please be patient with us and we'll see what happens. Uh, please continue to be in prayer for those that have contracted coronavirus this week. And please pray that it will not spread any further than it already has um, over the last few days here in Queensland. Let me pray this blessing for you as we conclude our time together. May the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will, working in you what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. See you next week.